Looks like I'm live, is that right, Matt? Hey guys, uh, welcome to Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy where the proof is in the singing. And uh, we have a fun day today, how to hold long singing notes, five amazing hacks. And before we get started, um, I wanna just say again, thanks to my notification squad, you guys seriously rock. Uh, I also wanna say that um, if you wanna keep getting notifications on cool new videos about singing, etc., uh, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel, that'd be great. And don't forget to ring that bell so you do get notifications uh, every time. Now, I wanna uh, put on my old spectacles here and say hi to some folks. Uh, we've got uh, Leonidas, seven to go, whatever that means. Nope, six million to go, I'm not sure what that means. Uh, six minutes ah, to go. Uh, it won't be long now, hua hua, good one, Bob. Uh, popcorn has been grabbed, all right, Olivia, cool. Um, just between my bridging and stretching workout, we'll finish after. Uh, should we begin soon? We're already beginning now. Hey, forum folks. So, uh, Ken from Malaysia. Hey, uh, Ferilius Gaming, I'm thinking about buying some property somewhere in, in Asia and I'm looking at maybe Bali, I'm looking at maybe Malaysia, uh, might be looking at Thailand, uh, Indonesia. So beach front, front property is what I'm thinking just uh, in case our country blows up and I need to come hang out with you guys. Uh, anyway, hello from Denmark, hello from Poland, hi from Germany, uh, uh, hola Ken, Angela Rivera, hey Angela, where are you from? Uh, anyway, so I want, I want to get started because I've got a lot to cover. I know we're going to have some people that are, are going to be coming on as we go and uh, hopefully if they feel like they missed something, they'll come back to it. But let's get started, gang. So how to hold long singing notes, five amazing hacks, okay? Now, it's kind of funny that we live in a culture where everything has to come to us quick, amazing, fast, quick, 30 seconds. Man, I can make you gnarly in 30 seconds. And yet, at the same time, these five hacks, actually, you'll see improvement right away and you'll understand it right away. Now, as with any quote hacks or tips or anything like that, please understand that there is a lot more to something than just a tip or a hack, okay? Um, a hack usually means, hey, how can I get into something really quick without having to, to go through all the fine print, you know, and and uh, have to do the work. I just wanna go straight to the hack. A tip is, well, I want something that is going to uh, give me some information quickly. It's not necessarily the sum of everything that's gonna make it great, but it'll at least get me up and running quickly so I can kinda decide if I like it or use something to get me from point A to point B quickly. So um, that's, that's we're somewhere in between Ken Tampa Vocal Academy lifetime singing program and five amazing hacks, okay? So we're gonna go through the program together. So. Now, um, much about singing is really misunderstood. And I gotta say this because there's a, there, I just see so much misinformation, disinformation, bad information, partial information. And there's a lot of misconceptions about the voice. And I'm gonna dispel a few things here along the way because it's gonna be important for us understanding these five amazing hacks on how to sing long, hope, long notes. So, um, and I know this firsthand too about um, what is misunderstood and, and misconceptions about singing because early on I had a lot of misconceptions about singing and just kind of tried to muscle my way through some things and I found out that that wasn't correct. So as with a lot of things in life, especially physical things, you know, that we do physically, um, we think that just to power through things is the way to get things done and it's not. Um, and I'm gonna give some really great examples because this is gonna be important towards the end. So the beginning of the things I'm saying now, I'll re-present them again later so that we can discuss them and why I'm bringing this up, okay? Um, and, but, but anyway, so as we think we have to power through things, this couldn't be further from the truth uh, in many disciplines, especially in the area of sports. And you'd think, well, sports, wouldn't be, that be one area you would power through something to get something done? Um, and it's not actually. In fact, I'm, I want to start off with a few different sports so we can discuss some things and some illustrations because um, I really believe this will hit closer to home when you see it in a phys from a physical perspective because a lot of singing is internal and so there are some, though there are some external things that see, you know, if our throat's bulging or if our face is turning blood red or we see us going like this, you know, we can see outside things physically but most of the mechanics of stuff happens internally. So if I use a physical, an extra physical thing on the outside to point to some stuff, then you can see how this is internalized um, physically in the area of singing. So 
Most motor skills and physical attributes to singing are not something you can see on the surface and therefore are misrepresented. They're misunderstood or they're just thrown out completely because someone says, ah, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. Well, there's a lot of things we can't see, like the air you breathe or gravity, uh, yet they're certainly part of, uh, the part of physics that we have and that we need uh, to sustain life. So anyway, I'd like to um, talk to you guys about something called the snap, okay? The snap. And I'm going to discuss that in, in detail in a second. What is the snap? Well, from a physiological scientific standpoint, fancy words, <laughs> uh, it, uh, doesn't it seem a little funny? That is, we watch two dogs running across a field, a little tiny dog and a big dog, right? And isn't it strange that that little dog with those little tiny legs can either keep up with that big dog and in some cases surpass or pass up the big dog, defying all science, defying all you know, laws of physics in that sense, right? Isn't that weird? And yet we know it exists. So you'd say, well, that's not supposed to be the way it happens. And yet it does, right? Well, yes, there eventually is, is a physics explanation for it. But from the eyes, from the surface of looking at this, it's like, well, that's kind of weird. How does that happen? Um, now, uh, when my kids were younger, we used to watch this show called Fear Factor. Any of you guys out there remember that show? Um, and it was a kind of a family thing. We'd get down. We didn't watch much TV or much media at all. We, we constricted a lot of media for our kids so that they'd go outside and do stuff or they'd use their brains for different things. Anyway, but the show consisted of ways that people had to overcome their fears, such as eating cockroaches or, uh, you know, getting trapped in some capsule underwater and they had to hold their breath and it was terrifying for people that, you know, had claustrophobia or fear of dying or, you know, whatever it was. Um, anyway, so and, and so each person had their own fear to overcome and they always tried to target what they felt like were people's worst fears, greatest nightmares, right? And almost invariably, they had a physical portion to the show and it was usually a combination of physical and mental and I'll explain that. So it usually showcased a person's mental uh, strengths and physical strengths and sometimes combined the two. And they always had people that voted, you know, in the, in the physical ones, there was the muscle man. They always had the big guy or big girl, muscle girl. And then the scrawny guy or the yoga chick or, you know, whatever it was. But they had different kinds of walks of life that would, you know, be the, the you know, for different physical uh, capabilities. So, uh, so you'd have these contestants and, and what they would do is they would, uh, they would like put a, a pole that would be strapped to a skyscraper dangling, you know, like a thousand feet below. And of course they'd have a harness that they would catch them or some kind of thing that would keep them from dying. But you still had this mental thing of looking down, you know, a thousand feet and then you're pulling yourself physically across a pole to make it to another side. And they usually made it kind of long. Um, and almost in every single case, the muscle guy lost. Really? I'm not kidding. Go back and look at the show. And you'd think, because he was the guy to be voted most likely to succeed, he lost because his muscle mass was so big throughout his body, even though he had a lot of strength here, he didn't necessarily have endurance, right? Because when you lift weights and do stuff, you're not necessarily going for endurance, you're going for muscle mass. You're, you're looking to look cool and lift a bunch of weight, right? But you're not looking for endurance. You're not looking for the relaxation response that you need to breathe as you go through and take these things. So usually the skinny guy or girl or the yoga chick wins. Really, I'm not kidding. It's the strangest thing, but it's the truth. So it becomes apparent and obvious because the muscle man or woman weighed a lot more and everybody thought they would win uh, that that wasn't the case, but we're preconditioned to think that way. So the ones that didn't have to pull that kind of weight or ha have that kind of muscle mass, but conditioned themselves for other things, always seem to, to make it across the finish line. Well, what does that have to do with the snap, Ken? You said we're gonna talk about the snap. Okay, I'm gonna start with this snap and I'm gonna explain this in golf terms and other terms in a minute. But here we have the snap, okay? And when we take a breath of air, we take it from our lung. We go, take in the breath, we breathe out. So the, the chest and the intercostal muscles in the chest, in the lung, as we breathe in, right? The, the, the rib cage expands, and as we exhale, the rib cage, rib cage collapses or contracts. Okay, so expands, contracts, expands, contracts. 
Well, it turns out that's we, we don't want to do that when we sing. We want the rib cage to be in an expanded state, and we want our abdomen or our solar plexus and abdominal cavity combined with our diaphragmatic support, transverse, transverse abdominal muscle that runs through the, the entire core of your body, down through the spinal column in the back, the, the, the sciatica um, um, through the spinal column in the back, and down to the buttocks. So as we go through this, guys, I've already talked about some of this. I won't have time to cover all that, but this plays a huge role in what we're about to learn. But we're into five hacks, so we're going to go straight to the hacks and not the core of these other elements. Now, I cover all of this in my singing course, and you, if, for those that really want to know, you've got to go get the course, you've got to go through my YouTube tutorials, you've got to go through some different things, sign up for my free singing forums, see the information that's in there. But So the snap is, as we're talking about the lung, the snap is, here's my finger, and as if I take a breath, let me do this to where you can see this better here. Okay, so I take a breath. No, I'm not. <laughs> I take a breath from my lung. I take in this breath, and then as I exhale, that's the amount of air. That's about the amount of strength I get. I'll do it hard. Okay, that's hard. Okay, now the snap comes when I have my lungs half to three quarters full, take in the breath, and I go like this. And the snap comes from my stomach. See, that's the snap, the snap of air. The snap of air from the stomach, through the lung, through the trachea, and exploding and hitting the glottis with an incredible amount of air. Okay, So as we speak, believe it or not, every time we speak, it's a mini explosion of air that could come from the lung or can come from the abdomen. Now, just like the muscle man, we're going to get more to guitar in a minute, but just like the muscle man or muscle woman on Fear Factor, they're chest breathers. They breathe from the chest. They exhaust the chest very quickly. They exhaust the intercostal muscles in the chest very quickly. They create tension in the chest, then in the neck, then in the throat, and build tension eventually in the throat ultimately and constrict their ability to perform. Okay, they get fatigued really quick, and all of a sudden they can't hang. Hua, hua, hua. Right? Whereas the skinny guy, he's in a relaxation response, or the yoga chick, she's done this before. She's, you know, she's done planks for days. She can do all kinds of cool yoga poses, you know, the warrior and all kinds of other stuff, or even really you know, crazy stuff. So they understand this kind of stamina, this kind of endurance, this kind of relaxation response. For the most part, not everybody, but I'm making a point, okay? So that's the snap, and we're going to talk more about this now within other disciplines in sports. So my father-in-law was a touring golf pro, okay? And, um, you know, he, he wasn't a big man. He was probably around 5'8", five, 5'9", five, you know, 5'7", 5'8", 5'9". Yeah, he was like 5'9". And wasn't muscular, you know, but he was a touring golf pro and really knew his stuff. And I remember one time we were on the driving range with him and me and my son. And um, he was the sweetest guy, and he didn't have a, a bone of contention in his body. He was always interested in helping people. Now, here's this guy, you don't know him from Adam, he's on a driving range, and he's whacking these balls pretty far, and everyone's looking at this guy going, wow, how's this old guy killing it with these balls? And so he'll, he would go down the line, and he would look at people, and he used to get paid to do this, so it wasn't just like an intrusion, an invasion of privacy or, or space. He just kind of knew how to how to cajole people and, and, and talk to them gently and, and try to get them to, to hit the, and have a, a swing that was correct. And so there was a, a very large man to the right of us. He had to be 6'5", probably weighed at least 240, 50 pounds, solid muscle. He was a big dude. And this guy was taking swacks at this ball like, I, I'm surprised if he, if he missed, he would have broken his club. I mean, really. But he was only hitting at about 160, 170, maybe 180 yards. And for you guys, out golfers out there, you know, you can hit 250s. Some can hit 300s, right? And Dave was out there whacking out 250s like it's going out of style. And this guy's barely breaking 160, 170. A 180 was like, whoa, right? Now imagine, you're on a driving range and there's all these people standing in a the line. They're all practicing their swing. So Dave goes to him. Oh, by the way, my father-in-law's name was Dave. So Dave goes to him and he says, hey, you know, um, 
you really can't just muscle it from the top of your body, your, your big muscle guy, and just think you're going to take this swack and your elbows are moving, the wrist is moving. You want to make your arms straight. He's trying to explain some mechanical things to him. The guy's like brushing him off going, you know, no, I'm, I'm not interested. No, leave me alone. I'm, I'm good. I got this. I just... I just, I'm, not, I'm just not tracking with the ball and I'm not, my face isn't lining up with the ball. He had all these excuses, right? So my father-in-law just, you know, tried a few times and then let him alone. And he started to go farther down the line and make his way back to his original spot. So there was a woman down there and he helped her tremendously like, like that. But ironically, there was a little Asian guy that was next to us, next to this guy. So it was us, this big guy, and this little Asian guy. And this little Asian guy was, he's older, way older. He probably was in his 70s. And he was hitting balls like 150s, right? Just, just under this, this big guy. And so Dave goes over and he says, no, what you want to do is you want your arms straight. You don't want any movement in the wrist. In fact, he says, don't even worry about the distance for a second. I just want you to finish. I just want to see how, how you finish. And I want you to have in your hip, right here in your hip, when you go to swing, I want, when the swing happens, I want you to put your hip forward I want you to get your arm back, I want you to turn your body, and I want you to, to bring your hips forward, and I want the hip to finish so you can feel the snap of the swing and the finish, right? So he was explaining that the torque, the torque or the snap or the strength came from your, the center of gravity in the hip and using that as this power that would come through as he finished correctly. He said, so let's start with that. So he spent about a minute, two minutes doing this. By the way, this is fun guys, but trust me, when it comes to singing, this applies straight across the board. In fact, I can't believe how many things I saw my father-in-law do with, with uh, respect to golfing. And I said this also with baseball and some other things uh, as it was true for, for me and for singing. So anyway, so it's got this little Asian guy. And he's taking this ball and he's whack and finally he says, okay, now we're going to get some distance. I want you to keep the face straight. I don't want you to do this moving wrist motion because that moving wrist motion is changing the, the direction of the face of the club. Now, by the way, I am not a golfer. So for me to tell you guys this, you golfers out there, you're going to laugh going, how does this guy know this? And I've never played a game of golf in my life. I've hit a couple balls and failed miserably. But anyway, so I watched this going on and I watched this in description and his tutorial. And before you know it, this Asian guy's cracking off 200s, 210s. And this larger guy's looking over at the Asian guys, he's cracking off his 160s. And this guy's hitting 50 yards farther after in minutes, in minutes before he was swinging under this guy next to him. So finally, as fate would have it, Dave says, you know, or this guy says to Dave, you know, hey, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you could show me a couple things after all. He was kind of arrogant about it. Hold on, let me grab my notes. And uh, what was funny is Dave says, ah, no, I don't think I can help you. And I thought, that was a weird response. Because I thought maybe Dave was kind of pissed off a little bit going, yeah, forget you. You didn't want my help before. And, you know, I'm not going to give it to you now. So I thought there was some pride involved. And my, my father-in-law was not like that at all. Like, not at all. He had almost zero pride when it came to that, right? So I didn't say anything right then. I waited until we got in the car and I said, you know, Dave, why'd you blow that guy off at the end, you know? He goes, oh, I didn't, I didn't blow him off. He said, what this, that guy will do is that guy will take a little bit of my information and then he'll combine it with all the things he still believes about himself that to be true. And I'll just be wasting my time because the information I give him, he won't apply it and he won't use it specifically in succession, in order, chronological order, exactly the way I showed him. He's got, he's too full of himself or he thinks he knows best for himself. And so my information will mean nothing to him. So I'm, I'm wasting my time. I'd rather spend my time, you know, with other people that are going to utilize the information. He was just very cut and dried. He wasn't bitter. He wasn't prideful. He wasn't, and I thought about that. I thought, Man, isn't that true for singing? I've got this information. I prove it to you guys every day. The proof is in the singing. There's all these other people out there on YouTube and they're all talking, 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 talking and nobody is proving it. And yet I'm taking my singers and I'm adjusting a little of this and adjusting a little bit of that. And what are they doing? They're singing Pat Benatar. They're singing Ann Wilson from Heart. They're singing David Coverdale. They're singing Bruno Mars. They're singing this, they're singing that. 
things they've never sung before and didn't do well and certainly with not with the again with the endurance and with the a, a consistency and all these things so the reason i'm doing these live stream guys is it's fun for me to go all right i'm giving you the roadmap and the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and it's up to you guys to decide if the information is worth it to you but if it's not i'm going to go to the next guy that wants it and I'm going to give it to them and they are going to outperform you at half your size. Okay, straight up. So with that said, um, now this snap and I want to get back to a real quick story of my son. Before we got into, uh, into soccer, he was a big soccer guy. Um, we played a lot of baseball and I learned quickly that it was a very political sport as is soccer. And I didn't have any influence in the area that we lived in, so it became very frustrating. But there was one thing I did do. My son liked to pitch, and he was gnarly. And he was pitching 40 mile an hour balls at the age of seven. I kid you not, by himself. But he threw sidearm, and apparently that'll you know, rip your elbow out. So I got him personal instruction from a, the Cardinals' former pitcher, a guy named Dan Nalty. Can't make this stuff up, guys. It's all from the past, right? And Dan Nalty said the same term that I used for my singing. He said, son, what you're missing is the snap. It's like, what's the snap? The snap is when you torque your arm back like this, you get your hip involved exactly like my father-in-law talked about for the golf. And he said, you don't want you to get your arm way back here. You want to be right about here. You don't want to be sidearm. You want to use that body torque and use that snap to throw those suckers in. And my son got killer at it. This was also true for how he kicked a soccer ball. The same snap, the same snap worked for kicking a soccer ball. Now, it was interesting too because there, the, as we're going through this, I'm sure a lot of you guys could apply this to tennis, to, to I'm sure playing basketball, I mean, whatever this discipline, this sport is, this applies straight across the board. And you know, it was, it was really cute because um, I, wanna, I wanna talk about this because this is not only the mechanics of this, but there's a psychology to this too, okay? The psychology is, is I'm not gonna throw my everything into this to do it. It's I'm going to allow the mechanics to do the work for me, okay? We're gonna get into how to hold the longest singing notes, five easy hacks, it's coming guys. We're gonna work on it. I'm gonna show you some stuff that you won't get this information anywhere else because they can't do it and they can't reproduce it. I'm gonna show you, so hang in there. But anyway, so uh, th th there's, uh, as, as we're talking about the psychology, uh, um, within this same thing, I, taught, I, I coached a lot of soccer and I was coaching a, um, a all-star team at about age from 10 to 12 was an all-star team my son was involved in in soccer. And I've shared the story before, but I'm gonna make it really quick. I was co-coaching this team and there were about maybe some odd 30 odd kids on the field. And there was an American size football goal that, you know, it was a American football uh, goal post. But inside that, as you guys know, is also an American size goal box for shooting, you know, for soccer. So they're both two in the same and they happen to be the exact same size. So these kids were cute and they're all showing up. And again, they're about 10 years old and they're trying to kick these balls over the goal to get into the field goal line, right? To kick these balls in the center. And not one of them, even including my son, could do it. I never thought about teaching my son how to kick high. We kick, you know, straight, and accurate, and fast, and you know, different sides of the foot and stuff. And so um, as we're going through this, I'm watching these kids over and over and over again. And I walked up to him and I said, guys, it's about the snap. It's about getting your foot under the ball first and about chipping it and snapping that ball right over the goal. And I did it and I demonstrated it for him one time. And you know what? Every single one of those little boys with the exception of one kid, every single one of them could do it consistently over and over again. It was psychological. It was, it was mechanical, they didn't understand, but it also, that goal was so high, that it just seemed so high, they tried with all their might, all their muscle, everything they had in them, they tried, and they couldn't do it until someone showed them physically, specifically, and mentally that it could be done. Well, that's what I'm about to do with you guys here in a minute and have been doing with you if you're really paying attention and you're watching who's really doing this and who isn't doing this. 
who's just talking about it and who's actually demonstrating, okay? So anyway, um, as we move on, as I said, this is a really powerful metaphor for life too, by the way. This is true in, in business disciplines and we could talk about all kinds of stuff, but I wanna to get to the mechanics of this so we can get to, you know, to some actual singing. But anyway, oftentimes we go through life thinking we know what's best for ourselves and we can't understand Einstein's definition of insanity, which is trying the same experiment over and over again and expecting a different result, but end up getting the same result. Cuckoo, cuckoo. That's insanity, if you ask me. We must let go of our preconceived or predetermined, that we've always, I've always done it this way, kind of mentality and let go of that and embrace new ideas, new concepts, new things that we see working, okay? Now, the reason I harp over and over again on this is because the proof is in the singing, like I said, and I wanna get to a point where as we discuss some of this stuff, you guys are willing to take a risk and go the distance with me on some really unusual things I'm about to say, okay? Now, here's one thing. The first thing is, I wanna get back to what I meant about being misunderstood, you know, all these misconceptions about singing. 99% of the singers out there, maybe even more than 99% of the singers, believe that in order to gain volume, loudness, okay, that you have to scream or yell or shout. That's what most people think. I just gotta use more air. I've gotta project and shout and scream. That's one thing, okay? And it almost seems counterintuitive to tell people to start singing with less volume. It's like, wait a minute, Ken, how's that gonna help me? You want me to do less? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm asking you to do. I learned the hard way. It's not about muscling. It's about finesse. It's about technique. It's about building the right muscle structure. Now, are we gonna be able to cover all that today? No, of course not. We've got five hacks coming up. But the core and the foundation of this starts there, and then we get to these quick, quick hacks we're about to discuss. But I'm asking you less volume in building muscle structure and, and vocal resonance, getting the voice resonating louder and louder without pushing or without you know, uh, muscling our way through sounds to try to get it, to get loudness is how we get volume. Now, Ken, you're talking about volume. I wanna know how to hold a note. I know, give me a second. It matters, this is part of that, okay? I'm gonna sing a high note, for example, right now. And I'm just gonna sing, let's just do, I don't know, an E maybe, what is this? Here, hold on. Yeah. Right, here I am, leaning into a note it's called, and you could tell it started soft and it got louder and louder and louder. And you saw there was no effort. Let me do it again. Right, it just keeps getting a lot. Do I look like I'm struggling? I could do this on, on any note at any level, okay? There's a technique to that too. But the point is, is that I built up resonance. I built up resonance in my voice to where I don't need to shout at you to get to that volume. It's automatic. It's something I've built up over time that's allowed me the privilege and, and the ability to do that on any spectrum of my voice, any percentage of my voice, anywhere in my voice I wanna do that, okay? Now, this is why that's important. Because what I did was I pulled back my air, I used my abdominal cavity to do all my work for me, I took in the breath like we talked about. You can cover diaphragmatic support in my course. You can do it, use, use some of the smaller tutorials I have online. But I use the management of that air to drop into a sound, relax into that sound, and allow resonance to take over to get bigger on the sound. This is gonna be important for holding notes, okay? So, before I understood this concept, it just seemed absurd and ludicrous to me. I, ridiculous, I thought. You know, what? What are you talking about? How in the world are you going to get louder unless you, yeah, hey, you, know, you kill it, right? And there's a degree of that in the stomach as far as understanding how the breath works. I'm not having one of you guys to shout at everybody, but there is a degree of understanding first getting the sensation, the feeling in the diaphragm to have that kind of strength, but then also to mitigate or control that in the diaphragm so it controls this snap of air, this explosion of air that hits the vocal folds themselves, okay? So anyway, um, but it became more and more apparent that this was true, this concept, because the more I applied it, 
the easier and easier my singing got. Straight up, right? This is a guy that taught himself how to sing, had to spend a zillion dollars learning from all these different vocal coaches. Some had some information good, some was crap, some conflicting. Fer ferreting through and getting all that information and compiling it together is what I've done for my singing course. Is putting everything I've learned in that and saving everybody the time and trouble of going all these fancy coaches that cost a thousand dollars an hour now, you know, to get to this incredible information that's very hard to come by. Now, I obviously need not be able to cover all this today, but we're going to get to the hacks. Um, but anyway, now before I start practicing the mechanics of this, I also want to discuss a little bit further about the psychology of this. Okay. When we talk about you know this this you know my son and 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 hitting the goals, but we also think of singing. The higher we go, we think it's harder to get to. And I was guilty of this growing up, and it's not that way. In fact, the way I look at my singing voice now is like an elevator shaft, and there's different floors. Okay, now there's a cable and there's an engine that takes my my elevator cart to different floors. So there's certainly that. And the higher up I go, to some degree, we do no, need more strength. There is no question. I have something called equal resistance. You guys, I may have talked about this, but it's that rubber band that you, t you have around your legs with the two handle grips on it. And it's isometric training where you pull on that rubber band that's around your feet like this, and you train with this rubber band like that. Well, the higher up you go in the scale or the more tension on that rubber band or resistance on the rubber band, obviously the more strength that you need. So the higher up we go, the more abdominal strength we need. But it's not in the same kind of way. It's super governed, super controlled, and it's very, very finesseful, and it's very nuance driven on how exactly to get to those steps. So we're gonna talk a little bit about this when we cover the breath in a second. But here, so in the same way that we feel we need to shout to get louder as we're calling out to a friend across the street or rooting for our favorite sports team, coaching a, coaching a team like myself, or giving a public address, you know, talking in public, um, uh, things that we do uh, physiologically in singing, we think that the power to power through the hey, give me one, two, three, four, I got going once, going twice, going three, hey, going on, uh, see the man in the back, blah, blah. you know, we think that that's what's going to get us what we need, and in fact, it's not. It's going to fatigue us quickly. We're the muscle man, and fear factor, and we only get three to five songs before we fatigue, and then we start to lose strength in our body. Okay, so one example of this again is as I did that high note. I just want to sh point out that notice I didn't look up. I went. Hey! Right. I didn't look up. I looked straight on. Why is that important? Well, psychologically, what we do is we go. Hey! We think that looking up, the notes are on the ceiling. <laughs> and we think by looking up somehow that's going to get us the height because we think higher is up, right? Okay, now let's get back to the elevator shaft. So now I think of my voice as powerful abdominal strength, diaphragmatic support, this compression of air in the lung, the snap of that sound, how it goes from my abdomen through my intercostal muscles and through my, my lung, my whole lung capacity through the trachea, excuse me, yeah, trachea, not the esophagus, trachea, and then hitting the glottis, glottal compression. We're compressing air, at, actually in the chest, in the neck, and at the glottis, okay? Now, when I look up, it constricts air. It, try it, go like this, go, go, ah, uh, I want you guys to do that, just go, ah, uh, and tilt your neck all the way back and see how much con how much constriction you feel, right? Now, another little funny side note. There's a vocal coach out there giving the most wacky advice, telling people they don't have to do scales because they're counterproductive and flopping around like an idiot going, look, ah, see, I can do all this and I can sing any note I want to sing. What the hell is that? And he claims to be a sports guy before he became an actor in sitcoms in the 80s, right? He was a, not sitcom, excuse me, um, he was a Days of Our Lives or some t t uh, TV show, like, you know, daytime drama t TV show. Folks, please don't listen to that bull crap. It's just crap. It's more noise. It's more baloney. You can see clearly and oftentimes, even in sitting, sometimes if I want to sing a song and it's a hard song, 
I myself can't even sing. Like if I were to sing She's Gone by Steelheart, I don't think I could do it sitting down because I lose up to 30% of my support when I sit down and I understand how to do it really well. That's this old Steelheart song that's very hard to sing with some high notes. I have to actually stand up to get the full torso capacity of, of every, all the mechanics, not tilting you know, the spinal column in any direction and just really being conscientious about all the mechanics that go into it to be able to finish and finish well and not get caught up in the cycle, the vicious cycle of the strain that builds on itself that is a mother to try to get out of, okay? So as we look up, back to elevator shaft, I have this elevator shaft and I think of my vowels as on which floor, and each floor is the note value. An A3, an F3, F4, G4, A5, and so on. I think of these as different floors. I want, ding, I want to go to A5 today. Ah! And that's actually not high, A5's way up there. I'm going to get warmed up for that. Didn't even warm up yet today, by the way, so we're going to do this together. But as I push that button, I know, okay, this is the sensation I've conditioned my body to be in. This is the muscle memory that I've built throughout the body to get to that note so that I don't just, it's not rolling the dice going, am I gonna get to that note today? Okay, let's go. Yes, I made it, woo, oh, thank you. No, I don't ever think that way. I think this is how I get to it. This is, it, it, it's a consistent, legitimate, very um, uh, organized from chronological in order. You start with this, then you do 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 this, and these things work in concert with each other in order to get to these notes. So as, as we look up, we don't wanna do that. We wanna look straight on. So we don't wanna constrict the trachea and the airflow that's going to the glottis. We don't want that sensation of strain. The notes aren't on the ceiling. It's not about looking up to get a note. Sometimes we do it for effect. Sometimes we do it to look cool, you know, whatever. But we really want to keep straight on. The next thing, and by the way, that's the exact opposite response that you want, right? The opposite, you know, you think you're good, but no, it's the opposite. Another thing we do is when we go for that note, we tense the whole body up. Okay, now we're, now we're starting to get into how to hold long, five long, five hacks, you know, amazing hacks to holding long notes. So we think of this as like a muscular feat, like picking up a heavy object. What do you do when you pick up a heavy object? You okay, here's that sparklets bottle, man, that sucker's heavy, it's five gallons. I'm gonna get up everything I've got in my body, I'm gonna lean over, I'm gonna pick it up, put it over my shoulder, and I'm gonna make it up those stairs, and then I'm gonna set it in my kitchen, and I'm done, right? Wrong, no. In fact, even just the lifting process is important. You ever heard the old saying, you know, be a forklift, not a crane? What does a forklift do? A forklift goes, jigga, 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 puts it under the sparklets, follow goes, jigga, 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 right? And then backs up, jigga, 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 and then takes it to its destination. A crane leans over like this, gets the lower back muscles involved, comes back and goes, oh crap, I think I just pulled something in my back. Oh no, ah, mayday, someone help. Whereas if I walk over to it and I lean down on my knees, or excuse me, I, I crouch down towards my knees, and I pick it up like that, and then I stand back up with the water bowl, and I never lean over to get it, and I carry it up that way, it takes away the strain on the back. It's the torque of the legs that matter, the snap of the legs, the torque the center of gravity, the center of balance. We could talk about wrestling in the same way. Wrestlers with good center of gravity could take on the 200 pound guy, could take on the 300 pound guy because he understands leverage, torque, using that to his advantage, right? Think about how these disciplines are all across the board. They all matter. Now, before I get into this other part, so we talked about how we think of heavy lifting, holding a long note, getting to a high note, right? There's a response where the whole body wants to shut down. Now, in another discipline, deep sea free diving. Deep sea free diving. The diver has learned how to control the body to relax in such a way that it doesn't use oxygen. In fact, it's almost anaerobic, which means in the absence of oxygen, be able to perform a task in the absence of oxygen, okay? So he's able to go down a couple hundred feet, sometimes deeper, and hold his breath for three, four, even five minutes doing something where his body should be using this oxygen. Well, so how is it possible he's able or she's able to do this? He's trained his body 
to not need it, to not need that oxygen, to calm down, to relax all the body. Even the body's doing motion, it's doing its thing. He's down swimming, he's picking up a rock and he's climbing, he's swimming into the surface. And he doesn't get up at the top either and, and be so out of breath like he's gonna pass out and die and need to be rushed to the hospital. He's even controlled and trained the muscle response and psychological muscle response to not freak out, right? And that when he gets up, that he can bring his heart rate down very quickly because he's trained that part of the body also because a high heart rate uses oxygen and, 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 and. So all these things, they seem mysterious, but they work and we're seeing it all around us in all these different disciplines and we're gonna apply it to singing. So as we've done that, we've reached down, we've grabbed the object, right? So it is with the voice. Now, in this exact opposite response, we wanna to get to this response of relaxation, okay? And not only is it good for the note that we're trying to sing, but it creates less stress on the body rather than more stress to give us endurance, to give us the ability to go back and do this again and again. So when I show you in my singing course and in my tutorials on diaphragmatic breathing, I have a sit-up exercise, right? Where I show people how to, how to do this exercise of the abdomen and so forth. And I really want you to get the course to get that because I don't want you to miss this if you're interested in, in correct diaphragmatic support. But it's most people when they do sit-ups, and I have you do sit-ups and singing some crazy stuff. Most people when they do sit-ups, they do crunches. And they go, rah, 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 and they do 20, 30, 40, 50 sit-ups and they never relax the abdomen between the sit-up. That's also the exact opposite response we want. We want to do one sit-up and sing the scale one time. We want to come back down. We want to completely relax the body like a marionette. Just completely relax. Get control of the body again, take in the breath, and do the next one. So we want to do this exactly the opposite of the way the guy's doing crunches, right? Very, very important. Now, when we see singers doing this, we see the muscles, the muscle man singers, they go through, they sing three, four, five songs in a night, and immediately you see them start to fatigue and lose their voices. Great singers, it's the opposite. For me, when I do a 10 song set, around 10 songs, 11 songs, 12 songs, I'm just getting warmed up, straight up. I'm just, I'm finally going, man, ah! And usually in a 10 song set, your, your, your set is over and you're going, gosh, I could do that so much better right now. Most people, they're thanking their lucky stars that the set is over. Me, I'm like, I could totally do this again. Bring it on, okay? So the exact opposite should be true. You shouldn't be fatiguing as you're going through this, unless you're getting started and building muscle structure. Don't think you're gonna go into a gym and start picking up big weights and you're, you're not supposed to fatigue quickly. We work our way up to this with correct information, correct training, right? But when you're at this level, you get to the point where you're ready to go and you can go for long periods of time and it's building muscle, not tearing it down, okay? Yes, there's some degree of tearing it down in the sense that when you build muscle, you tear it down, it rebuilds, you build more, tears down, you build, you build more. But that's what I mean in that sense of working out, okay? Now, uh, muscle structures are really interesting too because uh, I love some people how they say, it's just science. I mean, come on, anyone should be able to do it. It's just science. Well, if it's just science, pal, why aren't you doing it? Because you don't understand the mechanics, the correct mechanics, how they work in concert with each other, what it takes to get one muscle to do another muscle, you work with another muscle to work with another muscle group to work with another muscle group. So while it's just science, it's the little dog kicking butt on the big dog because it's just science, right? All right, so let's keep, continue here. Um, now, the the... First thing I want you guys to do is we're going to start to hold our breath. and But before we do that, we're going to mitigate some air back and forth. We're going to control the breath. And as we control the breath, um, I'm going to have a couple things here. Let's see, what did I do with it? Ah, here it is right here. We're going to do, go to hack number one. And hack number one is I'm just going to sing a low note. And I'm going to grab my guitar again. And ladies, you're going to do this up the octave. And we're going to sing just a... Okay, actually, I want to um, start on an A vowel, so we're going to sing an A. And as we sing this A, girls, you're going to be there. Before we do it, I just want you guys to try something for me. I want you to take air in the lung. This is hack number one. It's breath control and breath management. So, as we start on this A, I don't know if you guys remember, before we get to the actual singing of the note, I did a live stream and I talked about how the chords resonate, how they vibrate. You guys remember that one? And lower notes 
vibrate faster. We just discussed this. And as we go up the scale, higher notes vibrate quicker. That's how we get note values, right? Hertz frequencies. We just talked about Hertz. I think it was the last stream or the one just before it. Well, as it turns out, the higher up we go, the faster the vibrating of the folds, the easier actually it is to sing, uh, to hold the breath or use less air, I should say, to use less air in the note, but the more strength is required in the abdomen. Let me say it again. The higher up we go, the more strength is required in the abdomen, the equal resistance. Remember of the rubber bands? Remember pulling equal resistance, isometric training? The higher up we go, the more strength we need, but the less air is required because the folds are going faster. They're not like warbling like this, or they're not like when people sing and, sing and fry, it's sort of this, uh, allowing a ton of glut of air to come across the folds. And we're gonna talk about that when we get to distortion because that's extremely important. But remember, now, we're not looking for loudness. Loudness comes by resonance. And I'm gonna do a whole, a whole uh, tutorial on resonance. And Bob, I've got my, my, my right hand guy, Bob. Bob, if you can remind me, I'm gonna, I wanna do one of these on resonance. I wanna do one of these on distortion. I wanna do a very comprehensive one on, on um, diaphragmatic support and actually sing some songs with it, how that compression is applied to singing and so forth. So I'll pick these subjects off one at a time. Right now we're into five acts, we're in hack number one. So is the breath. So I don't have time to cover the diaphragmatic support of this, but I want you guys just to hold the breath. Just take a breath, hold it. See how long you can hold your breath. That's it. Don't do anything else, just hold it. I'm still holding my breath. I'm not taking any breaths right now. Now I've gotten good at this over the years, so I'm probably gonna be better than you at this. People are gonna go, why is Ken Tamplin just staring at me doing nothing right now? Because you missed, you came in late. You came late. Anyway, I'm still holding my breath and talking to you. I'm not taking any breath yet. I could go for a really, really long time, you guys. Okay, that's about half. I could like, I could go a lot longer than that. Some of you out there went, I was done. Now that has to do with, you know, whether you're physically fit, that has to do with whether you're used to doing this or not, but that's not my point. Gee, how long can you hold your breath? Now, I want you to hold your breath and we're gonna do this note. Guys, you're gonna do an A3, girls, you're gonna do an A4, okay? Here we go, and we're gonna do it on the A vowel. And we're gonna take in as much air as we can, right? And I don't have time to talk about the diaphragm, but we really wanna get that involved, but I'm just gonna talk about hack number one, which is breath management, breath control. We don't care about the loudness. The loudness comes with resonance. All we care about is holding the note. Do it with me, I'm gonna do mine. Okay, I can go a little longer, but you get the point. Now, some of you probably petered out way before that. Maybe some of you just sang longer, okay? I can do quite a bit longer actually, and I could take a bigger breath. Now I have a, a, a interesting, I did a, the longest notes ever held in the world, and I'll ask my associate Bob to put that in the description. You can clearly see from people that hold the longest notes, it's not just because they have some big lung capacity, it's that they know how to compress or govern the air. The guy that does that crazy, crazy, crazy long note that's number one, it's not because he has all that much air in his lung, it's that he understands how to compress the air and allow the resonance of the chords while air is compressed at the glottis with that explosion of air from the diaphragm, how to have glottal compression, compress the air at the glottis and be able to sustain these long notes. Now, the higher up we go, the more strength that we need in order to be able to sustain those notes without any sort of tension. Very, very important. This is where open throat technique comes in. And again, that's in my course. If you want to understand that, all these things matter. All of them work together. Right now we're talking about five hacks to hold long notes, okay? So that's hack number one. That's the first thing we want to do. We want to understand how, literally, how to compress the air. The second hack is vowel 
uh, excuse me, the, the first one was support. I showed you support. That I, I meant to make that hack number one, the support and sustaining that from the abdomen. That was hack number one. Hack number two was breath management or breath control, which is what we just did. Um, and hack number three is vowel placement. Remember I said about the elevator shaft, okay? So this time, I want to do it on an ah vowel, okay? And I want you guys to think like, you're, like the doctor wants to see your tonsils. I want you to get the brightest ping that you can. I want you to avoid singing airy, okay? So what I did was, I'm literally singing while I'm holding my breath. That's all I'm doing. I'm holding my breath and I'm singing. And I'm not gonna, this time, I'm not gonna go as long as I normally can because I don't wanna take the time to bore you guys with how long Ken Tamla can hold notes. That's not the point. The point is just to get you to understand it. You can do these on your own. I'll just do it so that you guys have it and understand it. Now, remember the vowels are different. So, I'm gonna do a G, a G a three, and ladies, I want you to do a G four. And usually for you, um, uh, contraltos, this is kind of the beginning of your of your call register. So your speaking register into your call register. So this may be a little low, a little low. It's like the beginning of your warm up note. So know that you can start here and work your way up the scale. And you guys can do this all the way up the scale and practice these things and holding the notes. But on an ah vowel, like the doctor wants to see your tonsils, I want you to take in a nice big breath, as big as you can, and like you're talking to me, like you're holding your breath, talking to me like this. La. I could go, ah. that's how much more breath I had left, okay? But at the end, um, I cracked a little bit because I let go of the breath. Um, but you can see, again, how it is that we can hold these notes. Now, you're gonna say, well, wait a minute, okay, how do I apply this to singing? I know, there's a lot to this, guys. It's not just one thing, we're gonna take this a step at a time. But now you can see how I can hold it with resonance on a bell. La, right? And when I do this correctly too, when resonance takes over, we relax into a state of oscillation, which is what we call vibrato, right? That is taking a note, a hold of a strongly or well-supported whole note with good breath, good breath control, good open throat technique, and relaxing into a state of oscillation. So let me explain this again, and I'll show you what I mean. How resonance takes over using the same amount of air I'm not adding more air to this. If, if anything, I'm compressing more air to the sound and I'm cutting back the air even more. Here, the vibrato, I start to relax into vibrato and then the oscillation becomes brighter. The resonance becomes brighter, which means it's projecting sound louder with no more effort. As I compress the air, and stay compressed in the sound, I build the muscle memory for that resonance to be able to create sound. So I'm not muscling, I'm not pulling myself across a thousand feet and using my muscles here, I'm building the muscles here, well here to sustain the muscles here, to allow my voice box to get bigger, my folds to get stronger, the resonance and brightness and loudness and timbre of my folds to get louder and brighter, okay? Now, there is a series of exercises you need to do for this. I cover all of this in my singing course. You wanna do all the different vowel tones. And a lot of people default to something called twang, okay? Twang is a term that was made by a lady back in the 70s and it started out with vocal fry and she went in from fry into twang which is singing the eh vowel because you can get a lot of brightness and power out of the eh especially in your upper edge of you know that kind of sound you can get a lot of a lot of brightness in that sound the problem is is it's one dimensional and it only works and, and it only strengthens a certain part of your vocal folds and so you find yourself becoming extremely shrill very nasally and annoying in your upper register relying on this one shrill eh sound or eh like lead sound throughout the whole spectrum of all the vowel tones 
It, all vowel sounds stem from it's the la, ah. And once you develop ah as your big resonant vowel, then you can start to branch out into the other vowel tones. And even in that vowel itself, as you ascend and descend, you have to compress and close that vowel down and make it smaller by changing the sound of the vowel as you go higher and then reopening that vowel as it comes back down. I know this is a lot of information. I cover all of that in my singing course, but this is all part of the pie of how this all works together. So hack number four, velocity and loudness of management. So as you saw me, what I just did was hack number four was from vowel placement Vowel velocity and management. Now I want you guys to try something. Be careful on how you do this. Is we're going to go back to the A vowel. We're going to go back to the A3. Okay, ladies, you on A4. And I want you to do something called leaning into the sound. That just means making a little, a little, little louder. Okay, you're going to hold your breath and you go. sensation or you are not sensation you're going to literally be making the sound a little louder now be careful because if too much air passes across the chords you over bloat the chords and then they collapse or they give way okay and we don't want you to be, hey, hey, get that sensation we don't want that we just want enough to where you can hear what I'm talking about about the brightness of the resonance so as long as you can, cutting back the air, maintaining the brightness, not letting any airy <sighs> whisk, whisk sort of sound, whiskey sort of sound come across the folds. Resist that. Cut back the air like you're talking underwater. Hey man, how's it going? Pretty good. What's going on? Not bad, man. I know that if I don't hold my breath while I'm talking to you, I'm going to lose my air and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass out because I don't have enough air, okay? So I want you to have that sensation. That's hack number four. Hack number five is seeing the note. Remember we talked about the psychology of singing, right? So let's do this another way. Remember I sang that high note, right? Let's go. Hey, right? For us, that's it. That for me, it's an uh, E4. Ladies, if you want to take that up, up an octave. Right? Now, when I sing that note, I'm not thinking about a high note. I'm thinking about my elevator shaft. Now, it, this isn't going to be as helpful yet to you until we can get to vowel placement and consonants as a subject, okay? And I'm going to do also a whole tutorial on vibrato because resonance and vibrato, I'll do a whole tutorial on that. We'll get to that stream on its own. These are hacks on how you get there. But that high note, if you notice, I held back the breath, I used my support. I'm almost using no air. I'm nice and bright on the sound. Yeah! Right? And I'm going through this and I'm leaning into that sound a little bit to get this little brightness to kick in to provide the resonance. When the vibrato is seated correctly and I relax into a state of oscillation or vibrato, it gets louder, it gets more robust with no more effort. No more effort. I'm not muscling my way on the building trying to pull myself through. I am finessing my way through the sound. So with that guy said, uh, I want to take some questions. Um, those are five incredible hacks, amazing hacks. And I want to open this up, up questions that are specifically related to this subject matter. I'm going to do um, uh, a, 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 a Q&A because I've got a lot of questions that have come through. I haven't had a chance to get through. But Christina says, hi, Christina Broughton. Thanks for the super chat with a money sign. You're welcome, Christine. Uh, let's see. Uh, Will, hi, Ken. My voice often starts cracking after A sharp four unless I push and make it fairly loud. Okay, well, that's, that's cool. That's because you haven't built up the muscle memory correctly. And usually voices crack because it's not supported correctly from the diaphragm. So you can find that you can cut back that air and not necessarily get louder, per se, unless it's resonance making it louder, doing the work for you, but the control of the abdomen to be able to sustain the A-sharp four because you haven't built up enough body strength 
in order to be able to relax, to sustain that A-sharp four with correct vowel placement. So, uh, and, and then you said, I've seen uh, other people sing up there with compression to grit without being uh, that loud at all. Yes, I'm gonna cover that. Thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I'm gonna cover, when you see me sing Dio, or you see me sing Iron Maiden, or you see me singing uh, you know, Guns N' Roses or any of a number of one of these songs, right? Um, Chris Cornell, whatever. If you notice and look closely, in fact, this Wednesday, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, um, I, I sang um, uh, Since I've Been Loving You by Led Zeppelin. And I do it Ken Tamplin style. I do it kind of Coverdale, Paul Rogers, Ken Tamplin, Glenn Hughes style, right? And uh, Sammy Hagar style. And if you notice, I'm like a roaring lion through the whole song, but it's pretty deceiving because I'm cutting back all my air. I'm not using anywhere near the air that it sounds like I'm roaring a line and making these huge sounds because I built up resonance with distortion and it's doing my work for me. Now, if you listen to um, uh, uh, Robert Plant, uh, 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 Robert Plant <laughs> uh, version, you'll notice he's really small on the sound. He's really, really, really small on the sound all the way through the whole time. In fact, most of this stuff, going to California, I don't care what song you ramble on, whatever, and I've got all those. I'll, I'll try to post those too when I go to do Since I've Been Loving You. I'll post all my Zeppelin tunes. You know, you can see how I did. But if you notice, he stays small and there's value to that. I teach that, right? And I teach only to get big on a sound as you can control and manage the sound because much bigger sound is much harder to control. But you are absolutely correct. They are singing with nowhere near the volume that it sounds like they're singing and they're not using volume to get to their distortion if they're doing it correctly. Let me say that again. They're not using volume or force to get to the distortion if they're doing it correctly. I'll cover that in a video on distortion. We'll talk about that soon. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Gaetano, what is the psychology thing you need to be a tenor? What's the difference to be a bass? Is the larynx less big? Whoa, there are a lot of, <laughs> that's a lot of um, questions that are not necessarily coherently laced. Um, a physiologically thing you need to be a tenor, what's the difference to be a bass in the, in the, is the larynx less big? Well, I don't know there's a such thing as larynx less big. Your vocal box, your, your voice box is your voice box. Can you grow the cords to make them stronger, more powerful? Yes. Does your Adam's apple grow bigger? No, <laughs> for, for bass, bass tenor for men. Um, and, and there is a very big difference between a, a baritone, a bass, a baritone, a tenor, you know, so forth. I happen to be a berry that sings in the tenor and soprano range all the time. So I have to shift the size of my vowels and the way I compress and the way I relax into those vowels and able to get to those different compartments of that elevator shaft. And I cover that in my singing course. That's not something, that's not even something I could cover in a two hour tutor tutorial. It's something that you have to build and understand. What, what I can say is this, in the last session or the one before it, when we talked about different vocal fox or types, what is my vocal type, you know, et cetera. I go through different vocal fox and types and each vocal fox, and you're talking about a voice type, it has a different set of rules to it that you have to adhere to those rules to sing within that range or the tessitura of that range. And you can get out of that tessitura and sing in other ranges with those tessituras, but they require understanding how to do that. And I cover that in my singing course. Struggle a little bit again, uh, with leaning into the sound concept. Yeah, you should, everybody does. Um, so the reason you struggle is because it's something that happens over time. We're building up a muscle structure. So we just do it a little bit. We just do a little bit, we keep it bright. The more bright, the more scales, the more stretching we do with the vocal folds themselves, the more it comes with the elasticity, agility in the cords, the more we put moisture back in the cords from compressing the air that I'm talking about and the mucosa and the lining in the walls of the, of the, the throat and vocal tract that also comes in um, with glutathione and some other things that also help coat the tract um, that the body creates it will actually give you the ability to get to that brightness a little by little by little over time. I push my breath out too quickly because if I do it slower, my vibrato starts to kick in. So I assume this is just a matter of training. It just depends. You don't want to over vibrato the voice. You don't want vibrato to be your main go-to all the time. And unfortunately, a lot of opera singers do that. Um, a lot of opera singers, they immediately, when they hit their whole tone, they go straight into oscillation because that's the way they relax their throat. Um, my suggestion is learn how to uh, not go into oscillation, land the note completely clean and clear first with a flat line, so to speak, like a heart monitor, and then slowly, gently allow vibrato to come in so that you can manage and control 
control that vibrato and it doesn't get away from you. So, uh, but if for now, if you want to learn how to control the breath first and you want to do that, yes, you can do that, but then also understand how to, how to get to that vibrato. Now you're right. There's another part to this that there feels like the throat gets kind of constricted when you flatline the sound as opposed to a, a vibrato sound. That is true. That's why, that's why we go into vibrato. It's a state of, it's a, it's a relax, relaxation response going into a state of oscillation. But the point is you want to have both responses so you have better control over the voice, okay? Rock Girl uh, 777, please do a video on nature versus nurture. Uh, would love to hear if someone with average singing ability can, be, can become awesome. Also, can pitch be learned or is it inherited? You know, I am so glad you asked that last question and I'm hopefully going to get one of the guys. Um, I, I just gave a lesson to someone a few days ago who started out doing Ken Tamplin YouTube videos. Now he has a gold bundle and he's doing the course, you know, some personal instruction with me. He says, and I quote, that he was tone deaf when he started. And what helped him was what I've instructed you guys to do was to pick up an instrument so that your intonation, you can resonate when your mind, you can kind of see the notes and hear them and play a note and then get your oscillation to oscillate with the note, like two propellers of an airplane. You know, when you finally land singing a note and playing it at the same time, you can hear its pitch and you can see it and you can feel it when you have an instrument, when you're playing piano, guitar, or whatever, right? He claims, I kid you not, and I'm gonna use this as one of my inspirational stories, just from watching Ken Tamplin YouTube videos, now he's doing the course, that he went from being tone deaf to busking for a living. He sings on street corners for a living and does well, owns an apartment, owns a car, has a nice guitar, an amp, and is able to afford lessons with Ken Tamplin. Straight up. You can learn intonation. You can learn pitch. Some are a lot worse than others. It may take you longer. He said he was completely oblivious to it and it took him a while. It took him a couple of years. That might sound discouraging, but in a couple of years he was able to get, and the sucker can sing. This dude has a beautiful range, beautiful warmth to his voice. He, he, I had heard almost no pitch problems when we were doing our session. There was some constriction problems and some breathing problems, but hey, man, right? So, uh, so nature versus nurture. He didn't have, he didn't have the talent. It wasn't inbred and born in him and he had to go after it on his own and did it just watching Ken Tamplin YouTube videos. Nikolai Rao, hi, found out that I struggle sometimes with ah, e sound combination. Hey, that's, that's really cool. Um, you guys are asking really great questions today. Makes me want to stay on longer. <laughs> it's already seven after. All right, so this is my gas tank. This is my head, this, this is my spout. When I get it steamed up and I shout, tip me over and pour me out. Did I really sing that? Yeah, I did. I had kids once in my life. Still do, they're older. Um, we have a spout. And this is the eval. It's the size of my finger. And we have a tank. That's the ah vowel. All vowels stem from it's the ah la. By the way, there's tea in here, folks, if you're wondering. <laughs> it's only 9 a.m. I don't drink at 10 a.m. I don't drink anymore. But anyway, so um, anyway, so we have this ah vowel. It's the biggest vowel we have, right? That's why all vowels stem from the ah vowel. If you master the ah vowel, you master all the vowels. If you go from e to ah into the tank, it's pretty easy. E -a, e -a, right? You're going from a small sound to a big sound. Now, it's not as easy as going from A to A or from A to A, but it's pretty easy because the small spigot goes into a bigger spigot. But when you go from a bigger spigot and A, A, C, and you go to a small spigot, if I have a funnel and the funnel starts small and little by little as it goes through the A valve, the funnel gets bigger and bigger and bigger and becomes A, how much more pressure is going into the throat when I take that ah valve and I pour it into that funnel and it squeezes all the way down to the E valve, right? A lot more sound pressure. So we use what are called mitigating vowels or we use connection vowels that go from one vowel to another. Remember we call bridging vowels? They're called lots of names, by the way, and I'll refer to them in different ways. Bridging vowels, connection vowels, you know, whatever. And so A goes, or from A, ah, excuse me, A ah to E, I go I. I use A to get to E. Now in my course, I, dis I discussed that the A vowel 
And I, and I have a, a section on a, a YouTube video called the family of vowels. A, I call it the love vowel. <laughs> Cause A can hang out with ah and ah, and A can hang out with E and, and the rest of the family of vowels, okay? The reason is, is it's an intermediate vowel. It's an intermediate vowel that can go from one vowel to another. So it is, so from I, really quickly we go, I, 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 we don't go I, I, we don't slam the throat into that vowel, we use an intermediate vowel, which is A. This is true for ooh. We don't go ooh from ah to ooh. Ah, ooh. We use O oh as an intermediate vowel. I feel like Sesame Street. O, oh, E, ah, right? So we go from ah to O oh to ooh. Oh, 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 oh. And when you get really good at it and really quick at it, no one will ever know that you're doing this, okay? All right, guys, we've actually gone over quite a bit. Save your questions. I promise we'll, we'll drag those in. We'll scoop them up. There's a lot of good questions coming in. I promise to get to them in a Q&A. Maybe not this next session, but next Thursday's session, I'll make a Q&A to get caught up on some of these questions. So for you guys out there that feel you didn't get your question answered, I can answer those in real time. So anyway, thank you so much for joining me. God bless all you guys. Um, next up is uh, the best diet for singers. So um, I said I would use uh, this next Thursday. I wanna get to diet, so I won't make the next one. Sorry, I won't make the next one Q&A. I wanna get to diet because we're in some funky times right now where people are getting sick a lot. We've got COVID out there, COVID-19. People need their immune systems build up. I wanna cover that. So on Saturday, so not this Thursday, but this coming Saturday, I'll turn that into Q&A so we can get to these, get caught up on the questions and then we'll resume with compression, distortion, vibrato, you know, high notes, all these other questions that keep coming in, we'll get to that. So anyway, thank you guys for joining me. God bless you. And until next time, remember the proof is in the singing. <laughs> until next time, gang, peace out.